it just feels like yesterday, and it was the first time I saw my mum, and she was in the wheelchair, and it was very emotional. Um, seeing my dad, my brother, I met for the first time in an adult because it was I was very young and didn't really know them. Me, me extended family, my dad's uh, first son and daughter from the previous marriage, um, got to finally meet them as well and. The, the the media were fantastic as well. They didn't, yeah, okay, they, they are going to try and get the best questions for, answered off me, so, but they the were very polite. And I thank them for that. And hearing people tell me, Nick, I was at the airport, I saw you, and I... I broke down in tears because it was so happy. And there's other people saying I was in the hairdressers and I I got a notification on Facebook. Someone's gone Facebook Live. I think the Chronicle went Facebook Live. And there's people telling me they're just stopping work and stopping what they're doing to watch me come home. And they were waiting ages for me to come. And they were like, come on, man, come on, hurry up. You know, and it just goes to show the amazing support that I had. And... This support grew and grew over the four years, thanks to my sister. It's nice that people care in the world. Like I said, many times I've had people from Australia, America, France, Canada, around the UK write to me personally, sending us parcels whilst I was in prison, and I thank them for the bottom of my heart because without their injection it would have been damn right hard it would have been unimaginable how I would have to have gone through mental boundaries and I went through so many mental boundaries as it was but imagine like there was no media and I, I respect where other families didn't want to do me, yeah, I fully understand. But this was a massive international miscarriage of justice. You can't just let things like this lie. You've got to show, especially when you're dealing with a so-called friend of the UK, India. This should never have happened. But it did. And it was continued to escalate over the space of four years. And people might go, well, it's only four years. I'm like, yeah, but it's four years I'm never going to get back. And I was innocent. I couldn't it's care it's if it's I was guilty. People going out with the lockdowns for staying there for one year. Yeah, and that's like relatively good. I know it's like, it's difficult to compare different types of pain, but you know, you can see how people go crazy mentally, having problems now, struggling. Yeah, lockdown's really been imagine, right? lockdown's been really hard for a lot of people out there. I do not June late last year I was trying my best. I wasn't going too over the top. Like I say, I, I still had a job to do. I worked all, I've worked all the way through and you know you you're not being selfish but you need to look after yourself. And I'm a nice natured guy and I'm always, I would, I, I'm not saying I'll go out my own way to help others, but I will help others given what is on offer. You know, if it makes me feel happy that I've helped others from feeling down in the dumps to feeling more positive, then I'll take that in a humble way. And hopefully my experience, yes, okay, I was in prison, but a lot of people are, thinking their home was a prison well it's not it's far from a prison it's safe it's a it's a haven you've got everything at your disposal you can watch netflix till your eyes bleed and most of the stuff on there does make your eyes bleed because it's crap but i i did do something similar i did an extreme lockdown and it's not it's not long when the end is that's the big problem as well isn't it well, this it is, is the same they said to you you've got four years bang and that's it 
and you know at least it's easier to come to terms with. Yes. But if you don't know, you don't know how long it's going to be. And we've not known how long it was going to be now, now we're over 15 months or so and yes things is getting easier and better. My heart goes out to all the families who have lost um, loved ones. Obviously I've got my own views on the whole thing but I, you know each to their own um, but it has been a, a very hard experience for a lot of people yes i've dealt with it in my own way it it has affected me i've not realized it till i had a a personal meltdown which happened in march where mental health is a big thing i'd never wanted to jump on the bandwagon and a lot of people thought I may have when I came back, but when positive things and good things are happening, why would I need to have that? Nothing bad was going wrong in my life. It was nothing but positives. But when I'm in a different mindset where I'm relaxed, I'm, you could say vulnerable, but without knowing it, and I've now realised I was obviously vulnerable. And... The demons came, unfortunately. Can you relive the experiences from the ways? Um, some, somewhat, a little bit, yes. Because in that time of my life, I was in a, a fight, survival mode. But being home with my family, getting on with my life, I'm a time of peace, and in time of peace you can be a bit vulnerable and i felt ashamed i wanted to take my own life i've never felt that way so in much detail i felt like i've survived this but how can i survive that and that I, I did go on social media and i came out and said look I'm not well. I'm, 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 I fell off the planet. I'm, I'm needing help, and I felt ashamed. I felt that this, why has this happened to me? Like, and I don't feel ashamed now. I've got pride. My pride's been dented. But you've got to do what's right for you mentally, and I've taken the help. And I'm going through talking therapy and I'm in constant uh, talk meetings with walking with the wounded. They've been a fantastic help for me. But the biggest problem that a lot of people face with mental health is admitting they've got a problem and no, seeking a big, help. A big thing about a few years ago with Matt Tyson Fury. He had this book out around the same time as yours come out. Yeah. yeah. And he talks about mental health lots in this, you know. Did, did you read this book? I didn't did read his book. Or? I didn't read his book. My book was in between his and Aunt Middleton's. So oh. <laughs> when I was on the shelves. But they, but they, I mean, it's getting talked about more and more. It is, and yes. Um, when, even when I came back home, I was still in that mindset. And I, and I still think this true to this day. There is a lot of people that use mental health as a as, as a, a way of seeking attention, mm -hmm. which puts off a lot of those who actually have mental health problems because, unfortunately, they feel like they're slipping through that hole in the net, and unfortunately, people do end up taking their life. And I felt like that. Mm -hmm. I felt, uh, yes, some, I'm having a bad time, and I didn't feel like I was that bad to where I wanted to see Cal because I, I I felt ashamed to where I could be taking someone's um focus away mm -hmm. and they're gonna focus more on me than those who aren't in the same situation as me as in being vocal about it. It took it took a lot of guts for me to come out. I was at the lowest of my lowest. I remember people when like 
that first saw me and how they see me now and it's only been a, a few short months so it does work but you've got to trust the system you've got to be willing to take the help I was willing to take it why I didn't go through with it to this day I don't know something deep down inside of me says Nick keep going and that happened in India I wanted to throw that towel in so many times when I was in India but that towel kept on getting thrown back and I was like I can't cry to mummy. I've got no one to cry on the shoulder to. This is me. And I've got letters to get the positivity sucked out of them to get me day by day. And I just, going through mental health that I am going through now, I feel better for it. It's a long road. Yes, there's going to be bumps. I did have a... A couple of days recently where I just felt absolutely crap. Not suicidal, but I just didn't want to be here. I know that sounds strange, but I wasn't thinking suicidal thoughts. I was just, Ugh, I can't be bothered anymore. I don't want to be here. And I know that sounds somewhat contradicting, but that's, that's how I felt. And that's, the you know, how I'm dealing with it. I'm, I'm, I'm taking advice from those who deal with their mental health. I'm going to do my talking therapy, whether I can be in person due to work or doing it via Zoom. I'm getting a lot from it. At the beginning, it was a, a bit mm, mm, not what I expected. I expected to be laid on this big chair and someone with a clipboard going, yeah, tell me, blah, blah, like you see in the films and stuff like that. Totally totally different basically chair sat there with masks on and going through it and a lot of it when you, you take the paperwork away from you a lot of it is like kiddie stuff but it's a way of digesting it better yeah, yeah. if you put complicated things in on a piece of paper you're going to just skip that because you might not know what that word means and you might have to google because some people like to use big words and fancy terminology and stuff like that. Keep it simple, stupid, and everyone will sing off the same song sheet. And just reading this stuff has really helped me. And it's going to be a, one of those roads where it'll end when it ends. But I'm willing, you've got to be willing to take the help. And my advice to anyone if you're having a down day and people like your friends and family are saying there's something wrong with you, don't bite the head off. I, I was quite fortunate. I knew there was something. I knew the cracks were starting to show. And it just took that one time where it felt like an earthquake just split my world apart. And now I'm gradually healing myself and it's going to take time. Do the same. Seek help. There were so many phone numbers, different organisations. Take the help, whether you're military or not. Yeah, definitely. Take it, because it's not to be ashamed about. You don't. You may feel like that, like I did, but you've got to do what's right for you. Your story is incredible and you're quite inspirational which is really really I'm really impressed with how far you've come and particularly the mental health stuff you were talking about saying you know that different some people put it on a bit too thickly and actually different it sort of obscures the other people I mean that's a really important message that people need to hear it doesn't get sort of talked about enough so that's impressive well that's how I've like see me coming home from India to how I think now, I've, I'm two di different people because I'm st I was still in that fighting mode, survival mode, and I was still thinking. And mental health was not talked about then; it was just coming to light, really. And obviously, when I'm in India, you don't hear a lot of what's happening around the world, 
anyone who's been in India, it's so India, 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 India. And for me coming home, I was just seeing so many people go on about mental health, this mental health, that, and I was like, and I can now talk about mental health after me experiencing it and now dealing with it now, but back in 2017, early 2018, I was like, why, why, are you, why is everyone, you know, feel that the, that going on about mental health? Why is everyone all weak and stuff like that? Pissy weak. And that was my attitude at the time. But as the years have gone by and actually what's happened to myself, my views have changed. And I understand. But what I won't tolerate is people using it as an excuse. Because those who desperately need it feel like then then the system's failing them. Because in any situation, he who screams the loudest gets heard. If you go to see a massive road traffic accident and you got people screaming, you're gonna go. Yeah, instincts is to go to those. And you forget about those quiet. The reason why they're quiet is because they're probably knocked out or they've got that something lodged in their mouth. They're the priority. The people who are suffering in silence. That's why the message we all keep saying is, do not suffer in silence. And it, and a lot of people said to me, Nick, you're very inspiring and hopefully with what you've, you know, you've kept what you've done and came out and said you've, you need mental health help can hopefully inspire those who are suffering in science to come out and have their voices heard. And I will continue to say that. Do not suffer in science because it's only going to get worse. For those who have social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I have shared pictures of prison life I had a spy pen snuck in they are legitimate they're not off the internet they are mine and mine that I've taken with me own but the prison life was so basic yeah. big cell cramped cell the first time shared with three other people hole in the floors a toilet using a bucket to wash in, to wash your clothes, to flush your feces away for if you've been in the toilet. You're basically living in cramped conditions, yeah, not getting the nutrition. Yeah, we were cooking our own food because we didn't want to eat rice and dal three times a day. So on average we were having one meat cooked meal a day and living off whatever I could get from the prison shop, maybe the odd biscuits or, or anything, and hoping hope that we received a parcel from home with a few little goodies in, like Haribo or stuff like that. But um, it, it was very doom and gloom. Um, sanitation was poor. We had to keep things as clean as possible because... What one thing you learn when you're ex is clean, 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 bullshit baffles brains. <laughs> um, what you can't see won't hurt you, kind of thing. Um, so we, did you have like a bar of soap in a bucket? Yeah, that, that yeah kind of and with a little thin towel at the beginning. Obviously, as time gets on, when family come in to visit, they can bring you shower gel and a, a proper towel um, and a, a pillar. Because I was, at the beginning, you get given two sheets, a metal mug and a spoon, and we're using my trainers and folding my clothes to act as like a pillar. Yes, I've slept in worse. I've slept in bad conditions, like in Afghanistan, in the middle of a desert and stuff, and like that, and Brecon Beacons and the pouring rain and all that. But that's because I was getting paid to do that, and that was the job at, in hand at the time. But to be in a prison where you shouldn't be in, it it hits hits one. The stuff we take for granted, 
I appreciate more than life nearly nowadays. I really appreciate because you didn't, you don't think that what we've got were creature comforts. We call them like bed and all that. You're never going to think, well, I'm not, I'm not going to not sleep in a bed, you know. But to sleep on the slate floor, aching, pain, you're losing weight quicker than what you would normally do. Yes, eventually we did get little thin mattresses, whatnot, with the help of the British government, but damage had been done. They were, in the heat, they just kind of shrunk even more. So they were, as, they were nearly as use, much as use as a chocolate fire guard, you know, tits on a fish, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Pointless, but they did help that little bit. But the day to day, like, would wake up, would have one of the Indians that we used to pay him and the odd fruit, biddies, whatnot, which is like the prison cigarette. Um, he would go and fill our flasks up, which were got via family, fill that with hot water so we could have coffee, whatnot, in the mornings. Um, two boiled eggs, chapatis, so we were able to get porridge in. Um, we have vegetables that we got would be potatoes, onions, tomatoes, green beans, cabbage. Um, we didn't get chicken at the beginning, but only on a Sunday, and then we need meat in our diet. We're not like Indians who are predominantly mainly vegetarian or at least eat meat once a week or something. So we eat meat practically nearly every day. Um, unless you're obviously vegan or vegetarian. Um, but you're getting one meal a day. It's not enough. And plus you're in a different country, health deteriorates, the heat. You, yeah, there was mosquitoes, yes. Dodgy looking spiders, snakes. And you mentioned before we chatted before that about the morale of the group. So there was 23 of you. Yeah, there was 23 of us, yeah. Three of us, yeah. Three of the now, At the beginning, yeah. Did that bring you closer together? Did you bond over this? Or did you find conflict? Or, you know, do you, I still in touch with these people now? Like, it's yeah. a really unique experience. Yeah, um, We'll come from different walks of life, different nationalities, different, you know, ways how we deal with things in life. Um, at the beginning, I shared a cell with one of the Estonians, um, the, an English guy and a Scottish guy. And we had a bit of a laugh, sharing stories from military and just life and You've got to try and take your mind off the doom and gloom and we played um, cards if we got them snuck in or battleships. <laughs> you know, tr just trying to pass the time. Um, as we, after we got convicted and we're all in one big cell, so we're 23, we're all in big one cell, kind of cramped up. Tensions do arise, family problems happen, people can get annoyed with each other. Um, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, I'm, I've said this a few times and I'm true to my word. You could have put two of lifelong best friends in my situation. They'd probably hate each other's guts right now. That, but they might later in life come to terms. Some people built relationship bonds um, I still speak to a few people but we're all thrown in together you know times change we want to be with our family we've all hurted at some stage in the four years I know I can only talk personally about mine but I've witnessed other people going through hurt and it's not nice um, you don't know what to to kind of say but you just try your best to to pick people up but you give them the space as well because their situ if it happened in a normal day to day life yes it's still hurtful but when you're dealing with a 
a legal situation and you're thrown in a prison and having to go through the heartache of, say, potentially losing family members. I lost my auntie when I was in prison. I had to deal with my mum having a double aneurysm when I was in prison. Other guys going through their problems. It's not nice. It's it's very, very hard. And to carry on and not give in, you, you, you never know what you're capable of till you're faced with a situation where you have to go beyond and beyond and beyond to survive. And I think we all went through a lot of pain, but we all went through different challenges and we've we've overcame it. I wish everyone the best of uh, health and luck to the future. My door is always open. I'm easy reached. I've got no b- bad blood with anyone. Yes. I'm not going to lie, I had some discrepancies and, you know, fallouts with a few, but, you know, that happens in life. But I'm not going to say I hate any of them, no, definitely not. I think the word survival there, I think that sort of sums up your whole story to me. You've been through, you know, hell and back, essentially. You've experienced things that most people will never get to or have to experience. Um, we've all got a survival instinct built in our DNA. You just never know when you have to call upon it. And you can't just go, yeah, I need your help now. It happens within at that time when you need to survive. And like I said, many times I wanted to throw the towel in so much, but something deep inside of me, and even to this day, going through my mental health, why didn't I go and take my own life? What stopped me? Was I that mentally exhausted? I couldn't be bothered. Was I the same as in prison? I couldn't be bothered to give in. Once I digested all the words of positivity in my letters, that just gave me that extra lift to get through the day and the day ahead and the the worst thing to do in that situation is to make the days feel like weeks, the weeks feel like months, and so on and so on. It's hard. What I've experienced, I hope no one else ever experiences that ever again. What happened to me and the other guys should never have happened, but it did. You can't re- live in regret, and and I've got nothing to... Re- be in regret about and be angry or yeah I'm upset that it happened because I met with the person in charge I sat across her desk with letters from our lawyers pictures of my mum in hospital with tubes coming out of every place in our school I said end this now you've got nothing on us And she looked at me and said, let the courts decide. I said, well, make sure your prosecutor turns up this time. So we were dealing with people who made it personal. Well, they did to me. They could have walked away and nothing would have been said. We would have been on that plane in seconds and gone. And I I wouldn't be doing all this. I probably wouldn't. I probably would have gone back to doing the job or something different, but it didn't. And that's when I felt you've made it personal. And I'm going to take you to hell. Well, considering what you've been through, you seem very in control, very level headed, very sort of unbiased, which is quite remarkable. I guess, the, can you explain what it feels like to have the control taken away? In, in the um. We are all in control of our lives and most people will never experience it being taken away unless obviously you end up in prison. But even in a UK prison to how I was in prison in India is worlds apart. We take our freedom for granted and a lot of people within the past year have realised what freedom really means. And if they haven't, 
I think they need to educate themselves. Because I certainly know what freedom means. I had that taken away. And I was thrown in innocently and wrongly in prison for a crime I didn't commit. And it brings you back down to reality on what you think life is all about. Family. Maybe you've had some family feuds in the past. Now is the time to let bygones be bygones because you only get one family. You only get one mum, one dad. Or, say again, you do get other stepping dads, but they're not your biological father. You've got to go beyond not let hatred control you. You've got to be a bit level-headed. You've got to see two sides of the story. I know that sounds funny because I, I look at their side of the story and it's all made-believe. They've made it, they've made a mountain out of molehill and they made us scapegoats for the Italian Marines wrongdoing and they made an example of us and they weren't shy about saying that when you've got the Indian Navy's Admiral to the media saying, we've got them. And we're sat in a prison reading this newspaper and we're like, you've got who exactly? You know, we, there was media saying we were going to conduct a Mumbai-style seaborne attack on a nuclear power plant. We were selling weapons to fishermen. This is what their media... So you can imagine when we're going into prison and you've got Indians saying white men probably for the first ever time. They're not taking us lightly. There were abuse thrown at us, stones thrown at us. I remember just being told by my embassy about what happened to my mum and I had to walk nearly a mile from the jailer's office to my compound and I was battling the red mist of fury because if I let the red mist take over I would have just thrown bodies around and probably end up killing myself and and that's not a nice thing to think but I would have taken out as many Indians as possible before me one and that's the honest truth of how I felt at that time. But I didn't because I felt I wouldn't make matters any easier for the rest of the guys and what would happen to my family, what, knowing that I had died in prison or made matters worse. But whilst I was warm back and getting stones thrown us, yes, I couldn't really understand the, the language that was being spoken, but it was the tone. So I knew it was hatred towards me the odd white guy, white boy, and all that thrown in, in the mix. And it was pretty much scary at times, especially when you, you're in prison and you say, we nicknamed him Slash and he had a, a little pouch in his gum where he had a blade. And seeing him do that, he would slice you and you wouldn't even know. He'd just go like that and slice you while walking by you. And... It's damn right scary. It is. And that to you, didn't no, no, he done it on himself for attention. He was covered in self harm scars. At one point, he was on the roof. How we got on the roof, I have no idea. And he was shouting on, and I was going to the kitchen to sort the, the milk out for when I was just saying, just jump, do all a favour. You know what I mean? <laughs> Honestly, he was, he was a proper worky ticket. And he got released as well. He's probably back in prison or dead now, but that's the reality. Most of the, the prisoners that way kind of befriended because you can't stay and feel down, angry all the time. You've got to, you know, like the saying goes, keep your friends close, your enemies close. Not that I saw the other prisoners as enemy. We got on well with a few of them. Yes, some of them were murderers. Yeah, the, the guy who brought our mail had... Uh, killed about 25 women or something and he was never going to see the light of day <laughs> but you have a bit banter you have a bit crack playing chess with them and all that and um help you help me and you know you get by things and prison life yeah you want to go through your time in prison with no mishaps it can't always happen I let me my head go. Do I regret it? Yes, of course I do. Because I sent us into a three-month compound lockdown 
to which I was well uh, the focal point of everyone's hatred towards me because it affected all of the, everyone. It didn't just affect myself, which I was preferring the the superintendent to punish me, not everyone. So unfortunately we all got punished and three months had to be in compound lockdown. Not quite, that was the next attempt. Um, we just couldn't leave for a compound unless there was a guard with us. And was that because of something you did? Yes, I kicked off in the hospital and caused a fight where tables were getting thrown, chairs, crutches, everything. And that's when the bed needs to be around. It, it did for a little bit, yeah. I'm not proud of it, but you've got to remember, you can't not escape that. Yeah, you're hurting. Yeah. You're innocent. And you're in a tinderbox situation. But after that incident, we made clear to the other Indian guards, we do not want trouble. Don't give us a reason to. And I think they got that. Obviously, the superintendent at the time, she was quite, you know, she didn't want any injuries to us. It wouldn't look good on her career and it wouldn't, good, it wouldn't look good. Because I always said to the guys, there's a few, there's a few re ways we'll get out of this. One, we'll do our time. Two, we'll win our appeal. Three, someone will die. And it, it was nearly that because the captain nearly died, which then we end up winning our appeal. And a lot of people were like, oh, no, 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 that'll not happen. I said, if one of us dies or gets seriously injured, we'll be out of this prison before you know it. They do not want us because it will look bad on them. It would, it would, yes. Um, it would be bigger than Ben Hur. Um, and that's what I believed anyways. If people believed over what, then that's their you know, opinion. Um, the prison didn't want us there. No, we had a meeting with the superintendent where we showed her the 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 paperwork for the weapons and she she was a trained lawyer as well and she looked at them and she went, why are you in my prison? And we're like, we want to know that as well. <laughs> but we were and we had to accept it as much as we didn't want to accept it. But you had to deal with it as best as you could and it was hard. And I'm not going to lie that, it's hard. No problem.